So Jung believed that the dream was the birthplace of thought. And I've been extending that idea because one of the things I wondered about deeply was, you know, you have a dream and then someone interprets it. And you can argue about whether or not an interpretation is valid, just like you can argue about whether your interpretation of a novel or movie is valid, right? It's a very difficult thing to determine with any degree of accuracy, which accounts in part for the postmodern critique. But my observation has been that people will present a dream and sometimes we can extract out real useful information from it that the person didn't appear to know. You know and, and they get a flash of insight and to me that's a marker that we stumbled on something that unites part of that person that wasn't united before. It pulls things together, which is often what a good story will do or sometimes a good theory. You know, things snap together for you and there's a little light goes on and that's one of the markers that I've used for accuracy in, in dreams. And, I know in my own family, uh, when, when I was first married, you know, I'd have fights with my wife, arguments about this and that, and uh, I'm fairly hot-headed, and so I'd get all puffed up and, you know, agitated about, about whatever we were arguing about, and she'd go to sleep, which was really annoying, you know, so <laughs> annoying. Because <laughs> I couldn't sleep, right? I was, like, chewing off my fingernails, and she'd be, like, sleeping peacefully beside me. It's, like, <laughs> maddening. So, but often she'd have a dream, you know, and, and then the next morning she'd discuss it with me and then we could unravel what was at the bottom of our argument and that was unbelievably useful even though it was extraordinarily <laughs> aggravating. So, so, you know, I was convinced by Jung, it looked to me like his ideas about the relationship between dreams and mythology and drama and literature made sense to me and the, and the, uh, and, and the relationship between that and art. I know this native carver, he's a Kwakwakawak guy, he's carved a bunch of wooden sculptures, totem poles, and masks that I have in my house. And he's a very interesting person, not literate, not particularly literate, and really still steeped in this ancient 13,000-year-old tradition. He's an original language speaker. And um, the fact that he isn't literate has sort of left him with the mind of someone who's pre-literate. And pre-literate people aren't stupid. They're just not literate. So their brains are organized differently in many ways. And I've asked him about his... His, his intuition for his carvings. And he's told me that he dreams, like you've seen the Haida masks, you know what they look like. Well, his people are, are closely related to the Haida, so it's the same kind of style. And he said he dreams in those animals and, and can remember his dreams. And he also talks to his grandparents who taught him how to carve in his dreams. Quite often, if he runs into a problem with carving, his grandparents will come and he'll talk to them. But he sees the the creatures that he's going to carve living in an animated sense in his, in his imagination. And I mean, it's not that difficult. First of all, I have no reason to disbelieve him. He's a very, very straightforward person, and he doesn't have the motivation or the guile, I would say, in some sense, to invent a story like that. There's just no reason he would possibly do it. I don't think he's told that many people about it. He thinks it's kind of crazy, you know? He said when he was a kid, he thought he was insane because he'd had those dreams all the time about these creatures and so forth. And so it wasn't something he was trumpeting. But I found it fascinating because I can see in him part of the manifestation of this unbroken tradition. We have no idea how traditions like that are really passed along for thousands and thousands of years, right? Part of it's oral and memory. Part of it's acted out and dramatized. And then part of it's going to be imaginative. And people who aren't literate, they store information quite differently than we do. We don't remember anything. It's all written down in books, right? But if you're from an oral culture, especially if you're trained in that way, you have all of that information at hand, both so you can speak it, you can tell the stories, and you really know them. And, you know, modern people don't really know what that's like anymore. I doubt if there's more than maybe two of you in the audience that could spout from memory like a 30-line poem. You know, and poetry was written so that people could do that. that, that that's why we have that form, is so that people could remember it and, and have it with them. And we don't do any of that anymore. Anyways, back to Jung. Jung was a great believer in the dream, and I noted that dreams will tell you things that you don't know. And then I thought, well, how the hell can that be? How the, in the world can something you think up tell you something you don't know? How, how does that make any sense? First of all, why don't you understand it? Why does it have to come forth in the form of the dream? It's like you're not... There's something going on inside you that you don't control, right? The dream happens to you just like life happens to you. 
I mean, there is the odd lucid dreamer who can, you know, apply a certain amount of conscious control, but most of the time it's you're laying there asleep and this crazy complicated world manifests itself inside you and you don't know how, you, could, you can't do it when you're awake and you don't know what it means. It's like, what the hell's going on? And that's one of the things that's so damn frightening about the psychoanalysts because and you get this both from Freud and Jung, you really start to understand that there are things inside you that are happening that control you instead of the other way around. You know, there's a bit of reciprocal control, but there's manifestations of spirits, so to speak, inside you that determine the manner in which you walk through life. And you don't control it. And what does? Is it random? You know, there are people who have claimed that dreams are mere merely the consequence of random neuronal firing, which is a theory I think is absolutely absurd because there's nothing random about dreams. You know, they're very, very structured and, and very, very complex. And they're not like snow on a television screen or, or static on a radio. Like, those things are complicated. And, and then also I've seen so often that people have very coherent dreams that have a perfect narrative structure. You know, they're fully developed in some sense. And so... That just doesn't, I, that theory just doesn't go anywhere with me. I just can't see that as useful at all. And so, so I'm more likely to take the phenomena seriously and say, well, there's something to dreams. Well, you dream of the future and then you try to make it into a reality. That seems to be an important thing. You know, or maybe you dream up a nightmare and try to make that into a reality because people do that too if they're hell-bent on revenge, for example, and full of hatred and resentment. I mean, that manifests itself in terrible fantasies. You know, those are dreams, then people go act them out. These things are powerful. You know, and whole nations can get caught up in collective dreams. That's what happened to the Nazis. That's what happened to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. It was an absolutely remarkable, amazing, horrific, destructive spectacle. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union. The same thing happened in China. It's like, we have to take these things seriously, you know, and try to understand what's going on. So Jung believed that the dream could contain more information than was yet articulated. You think, artists do the same thing, you know, like people go to museums and they look at paintings, Renaissance paintings or modern paintings, and they don't exactly know why they're there. You know, I, I was in this room in, in New York, I don't remember which museum, but it was a room full of Renaissance art, you know, great painters, the, the greatest painters. And, thought maybe that room was worth a billion dollars or something outrageous because there was like 20 paintings in there, you know, so priceless. And the first thing is, well, why are those paintings worth so much? And why is there a museum in the biggest city in the world devoted to them? And why do people from all over the world come and look at them? What the hell are those people doing? One of them was of the Assumption of Mary, you know, beautifully painted, absolutely glowing work of art. And there's like 20 people standing in front of it looking at it and think, what are those people up to? You know, they don't know. Why did they make a pilgrimage to New York to come and look at that painting? It's not like they know. Why is it worth so much? I mean, I know there's a status element to it too, but that begs the question. Why do those items become such high status items? What is it about them that's so absolutely remarkable? Well, we're strange creatures. Thank you for watching this video. This is the Archangel 911. If you enjoyed what you were watching, please click that subscribe button. Give me a thumbs up and uh, leave a comment below. Have a nice day.